Oh, God's really been good to us. Brother Blake said my microphone wasn't on this morning. Didn't nair one of you tell me. So I, I don't know what. Uh, I told him the, the microphone's just picky. I, I, I've only preached about three good messages since I've been here, and the, and the thing messed up all three times. And it's, uh, but we don't, we don't really need the microphone for, for uh, volume. I mean, we can get the volume up, but it don't make a good recording when you don't have the microphone going. So, uh, but that'll be all right. I reckon the Lord had a plan. We'll just use tonight. God's always got a plan, hasn't He? Isn't that amazing how He does that? And His plan includes you. And His plan includes me. God said He's really privileged us to be saved tonight. Looking around the room, I was thinking before we started, Brother Tyler said he was, uh, he was tired tonight. And, you, you know, it's, it's been a long week. I've seen tired on a lot of faces today. And, uh, you know, that's all right. We're going to rejoice right here. And the Lord wants you to get happy even though you're tired. Can you be tired and happy at the same time? You can, ha- you can be real happy because you know I'm going to let you go to the house in about two hours and then you can go to sleep. That ought to make you happy. Amen. You got a Bible with you, turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers. Going to be reading tonight from chapter number 14 of the book of Numbers. You find Numbers, that's way back. That's what they call a deep cut right there. You go way back in the Old Testament. Numbers 14, we're going to begin tonight in verse number 40. I don't know what happened this morning. We got so happy we didn't even stand up to read the Scripture. If you'll stand as we read God's Word together, if you're able. Numbers chapter 14, verse 40. The Bible says, And they rose up early in the morning, and get them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, Because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. Father, it is good to be here tonight. God, we thank you for what you've done on our behalf, that we know that we can have salvation tonight. God, we don't have to sit here and wonder. We don't have to sit here and worry, but if we placed our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that even if our life were to end at this very moment, God, you would receive us based on what Christ has done, the blood that He shed. Father, if we're born again Christians, we know that we have the hope of a home in heaven there with you. And we praise you for that tonight. And God, we thank you for this good number that's come out this evening to worship. Lord, we thank you for the good service, the good time that we had this morning. But we realize that this morning's not enough. God, we need a touch tonight. Lord, I realize there's a multitude of needs in the hearts of the people tonight. Some are sick. Some are suffering. Some might be sad. Some have lost a loved one. Lord, I don't know what folks are struggling with tonight, but I'm confident that you know every need. Lord, I believe that you're able to meet that need. And as we study your word tonight, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to each heart individually. God, provide that that's necessary tonight. Work in these pews, Lord, all over this building. God, would you just touch hearts and draw us ever closer to you. Father, we 
beg you tonight, if there's one that maybe has walked into this place that's lost without Jesus, God, if there's one here tonight that don't know the love, the pardon of sin, Lord, the forgiveness that Christ has offered by trusting in Him, I pray, Lord, I beg you to get a hold of their heart tonight. Do something, Lord, to draw them to You before it's eternally too late. Lord, I know that I can't do it, but I'm confident You can. The Bible says it's through the foolishness of preaching that You've chosen to save. God, tonight, if I'm a fool, I want to be Your fool. And Father, I pray that You'd use this message tonight to speak to hearts. Encourage them that need it tonight. Have Your will and way. We pray that Christ would be honored and glorified, not only through this service, but by the way that we live our lives, Father. And we'll thank you for all things. Help us to be careful to give you honor and glory because none of us are worthy. But Lord, you're worthy of all praise and all glory. Father, we give it to you tonight in Jesus' holy and precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you just a little bit tonight out of this, uh, these few verses that we've read. And I want to talk to you on this topic, the road to ruin. The road to ruin. Now, uh, I know that we, we have to consider where we want to be in this life, right? I tell the young folks many times as I talk to them, uh, and, 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 and Brother Tyler I'm sure does as well, but you, you've got to consider where you want your life to head. You've got to see where you want to be maybe in years ahead or, or months ahead, and you've got to prepare to get there. You know, it's the same thing in a Christian life as well. If you want to be close to God, there's some things that you need to do in order to draw closer to God, because the Bible tells us that we're just, it really the Bible teaches, I'm just as close to God as I want to be, Brother Anthony, I, the the Bible says, if we'll draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh unto us, right? So if I'm not as close to God as I ought to be, it's not God's fault. It's my fault. I'm not pursued a relationship with Him the way that I should. Now, as we think about maybe our lives down the road, maybe as we think about this church and the ministry of the church down the road, and even the larger picture, Christianity and where that it's headed, the troubles and, and the trials that face us, the, the persecution that that may await. We need to get our mindset now on the things that we need to do and be able to or be willing to stand firm in the trying times. Now, uh, there, I think that certainly there's a way for us to go and that way is the way that the Lord said to go. We need to follow God's path. We need to stay close to God. We need to follow Jesus. We need to surrender ourselves and submit unto Him. But I'll tell you, there's another way that a lot of folks have chosen chosen to go today, and there'll be another way that a lot of churches will choose to go in the future. They'll choose to go the easy way. Many times man chooses the easy way. He chooses the path of least resistance. You've seen that happen, and I've seen that happen. I'll tell you, the right thing to do is oftentimes the very hardest thing that a man can choose to do. A lot of times the, the easy way is just that. It's easy to choose that way, not a lot of resistance. When you begin to live for the Lord, listen, you'll have a hard time in this life. I promise you that if you start living for Jesus, if you surrender yourself, submit unto Him, lead folks to the Lord, and live a witness, you'll have a hard time in this life. Now, we look at the story of these Israelites. We know a little bit about their background. God has been very good to them. God has led them out of Egypt. They have been there for some 400 plus years and God has provided a means of, of deliverance for them. God has sent Moses down there to take his people out of Egypt, right? And we know at this point they've been taken out and God has done mighty miracles in the past. He did mighty miracles in delivering His people. Now, we find that the people there, they're about ready. Or God, well, let me just back that up. Maybe they're not ready, but God is ready for them to go in and take the land, right? That He's promised to them. God says it's time to go in and possess the land of Canaan. So if we back up just a little bit, we find that Moses sent spies out into the land. 
land. You remember this, uh, this text. If you'll go back and look, maybe read that on your own a little bit later, you'll find that there were 12 spies that Moses sent out. Now, the reason he did that was to get a good look at the land, to form some kind of plan in going into the land that God had given him. Now, uh, the God had promised that God had promised that it was a land that flows with milk and honey. It was a good land. And God had promised to give them that land. But when the 12 spies went up, they saw all the land. They said, basically, well, it's a good land. It's a land that floweth with milk and honey, just like the Lord said. But 10 of those spies said, what? The Bible says they brought up an evil report. That's exactly what it says. They basically said this, well, the land's just like God said it was, but the people there, they're entirely too big. They're large. They're, they're giants. And those cities up there, they're fortified. There's no way that we'd ever be able to take those cities. In fact, they said it'd be best for us if we'd have just went back to Egypt. In fact, they began to prepare to go back to Egypt. They'd rather go back where they were than have to face the battle that lied ahead or that lie lies ahead. Now, many times you'll find Christians doing that as well. Maybe they come to know the Lord and they come to realize the battle that lies ahead and they'll retreat from the battle instead of moving forward to the battle because that's the easy thing to do. Now, I want to share with you tonight about this road to ruin. What happened to the Israelites and what could happen to you and I in our Christian walk with the Lord? What could happen to this church? Listen, I want to tell you, I believe there's a great crowd out here on a Sunday night. I, I'm very well pre pleased with the folks that's come this morning and also tonight, your faithfulness to the house of God. I, I, listen, I believe in that and it encourages me when folks make it a habit to come into the house of God. But all over the land, there's houses of God just like this that there are very few people sitting in tonight. Maybe just a few years ago, maybe just five years ago, maybe just ten years ago, they might have had a very large crowd on a Sunday evening, but very few folks find it necessary now to come back. And listen, I want to tell you that many times these churches have gone astray. I'm not saying that that's always the case, but many times we have gone astray and not leading folks to the Lord or leading them in the right way that we should. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that Calvary Baptist Church and I want to make sure that the cause of Christ moves forward and we reach people for Jesus. Do you want to see people be reached for Jesus? I, I want to see lives touched. I want to see homes touched. I want to see lives changed for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's what we're doing. And being faithful helps us in that. Now, being, learning what we need to do, there's a good deal of, of uh, encouragement or hope in studying what we don't need to do so we make sure that we don't make the same mistake that others that have come before us made. Now, the road to ruin is just this. Now, I'm going to give you four things here in very quick succession. Then we're going to wrap up and go to house because be honest with you, I'm tired. So, uh, we're going to preach this very fast tonight. Number one on the road to ruin. If you start down the wrong road, number one is doubt. Doubt. Doubt will hurt you. Doubt will hurt your Christian life. Now with that being said, there's not a soul in this place that ain't never doubted in their life. There, there, there's not a Christian in this room that's never had to contend with some doubt in his life. There's been some things that you doubted. Well, how in the world am I ever going to be able to do that? Lord, do you know what you're doing? I, you, maybe you've got the wrong man. May, there's no way that I can do what you're asking me to do. Now, if you'll back up to chapter number 13... In verse number 33, I want to show you a little bit about this doubt. It says, and there we saw, I remember I told you what the evil, what the spy, the ten spy said that brought up the evil report. It said, and there in verse number 13, 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we, and so we were in their sight. So when they looked at the people of the land, they said, there they're so large that we look like grasshoppers. Our, our mighty men look like grasshoppers 
compared to them, we're nothing in their sight. So they began to doubt. They, they got intimidated, right? They, they, they were intimidated at the people. They obviously, uh, they, they weren't looking unto the Lord where their help came from. They were trusting in their own ability. And they said, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a good matchup. There's no way that we could go in and take that land. Now, many folks, when God begins to deal with them to do something, they say, there's no no way that I can do that. I'm not fitted for that. There's no time that you probably said that when the Lord called you to preach. God, you must have made some kind of mistake. There's no way that I could ever do that. When the Lord called you here, you probably went through a period of time. In fact, you told me you did. Lord, I can't do that. That's not where I need to be. You have the wrong person. Moses went through that too, right? If we look back, the, Moses said, he said to the Lord, he said, I'm slow of speech. He said, I'm not an eloquent man. Lord, there's somebody else is basically what he was saying. Somebody else would do a better job. And the truth is, every Christian in this room, we've sat back and waited on somebody else to do it. Hadn't we? Everyone, we said, well, there's somebody else better suited to do that. This needs to be done, or that needs to be done, or some, somebody needs to do that. Well, the preacher ought to do that. I've had folks come and say, well, preacher, did you visit so-and-so, or, or do this or that? And I say, well, I may have visited them, I may have not. And if they try to get me down the road about not making the visit, I'll just say, hey, did you visit them? Did you go out and visit them? Uh, you know, I, we're all just as equally responsible, right? We should visit folks. We should do for folks and do what we can. Don't just sit back and expect somebody else to do it. Sometimes I don't even know. Maybe the need. I've had folks come and say, well, did you go see this one or that one? Well, I, I, was there some reason I was supposed to see them? I didn't even know. And there's, well, nobody didn't tell you. Well, I, I thought so-and-so would have told you. Well, you know what? If you don't know, you can't help. So sometimes you got to speak up and don't just assume that somebody else took care of it. Don't just assume that somebody else knows. If you see a light bulb that needs changing, don't just assume that one of the deacons is going to change it. When you're healthy enough to get on the ladder, you can come say, hey, where's the light bulbs and ladder at? I'll take care of that light bulb. Come, and, you know, anything like that. That's a poor example, but, uh, you know, go out and reach people with the gospel. Use that to serve. But you see doubt. They, they doubted in, in their their own ability. The enemy was too large. And many times our enemies seem overwhelming. And especially today, uh, we're facing a backlash in America. We know that the country or the, the law or the legislation has become our enemy, has set itself up against us to a large extent today. And to be honest with you, it don't look like there's no way that you and I could stand against the United States government, does it? It looks like they're, they're, how could we defy the government of the United States and stand on God's law? I'll tell you this, here's how we can do it. We're not standing in my power or your power, but we're standing in the power of God. There ought to have been a whole amen all across the crowd. They said, we're not standing in my power or your power, but we're standing in God's power. Amen. That's a whole lot better. We can do it in God's power. So you see, there's doubt. Now, you see the reality of their doubt. It's a, it, it's a human thing. Sometimes we do that. But also the reason for their doubt. I mentioned that before. They weren't dependent on God. It's easy for me to look at what needs to be done and think there's no way I can do that when I'm not allowing God to work through me, when I'm not thinking of what God can do. The truth is, I can't do anything worthwhile if I don't let God do it. It through me. And you can't either. You can't reach people for Jesus without Jesus working through you. There ain't no way that you can do that. Now, you think about you think about David when he faced Goliath, when he when he faced that giant. You you had that man there, something over nine feet tall, and and and, and uh, uh, he he defied the the uh, the Israelite armies. There wasn't a man that was willing to go out against him. Could you imagine a man uh, near nearing ten feet tall with six fingers and six toes? And can you imagine how large a man that he must have been? And little old David, little old David. Little schoolboy, that would have been uh, maybe a, a fellow about, about like Malachi and say, and, and would stand up and say, I'll go and fight with this Philistine. 
And the first thing you do, uh, most folks, say, and they probably laugh. They said, there's no way that you'd ever stand against that Philistine. But listen, David didn't stand in David's power. He stood in the power of the Almighty. He believed that God could deliver because that man had defied the living God. He believed that he could slay that man. He believed that he could take on the giant. And I'll tell you, me and you can take on the giants today if we stand in the power of God. So sometimes there's some doubt. That's the first thing I believe that happened on their road to ruin. But there's also another thing. Disobedience. I believe there was some disobedience. Now verse number 22 tells us this. If you'll flip back maybe just a little bit. It says because all those men which, which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt in the wilderness and have tempted me and now these ten times have not hearkened unto my voice. They were disobedient to the Lord. Now if you want to set yourself up for ruin, not only do you doubt, but you begin to be disobedient. You, you doubt, if you ain't careful, will drive you to disobedience. Now, as we think about their disobedience, well, what do you mean? Well, they refused to follow God. They refused to do what God wanted them to do or what God expected of them to do. How many times do you and I refuse to do what God expects us to do? How many times have we refused to do what we knew for a fact that God would have us to do? We've all done that. We, we've all done that. There's been times that God was leading us to do something in particular and we failed to do it. Now, uh, many times when, 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 we, when we sin against God, we're being disobedient, right? And there's, there's not a person in this room that's never willfully and knowingly sinned against God. We, we allow, and, and I, I, I know you're not horrible people. Now, I don't know if there's anybody... In this room, living in some kind of uh, rampant immorality, if you are, I don't know it, and I'm not the spiritual police. I don't drive by your house and see who's parked there and all that stuff. You'll answer to God. You don't have to answer to me. But there's probably people in this room that allow sin in their life on a regular basis. And sometimes that person's you, and sometimes that person may be me. Sometimes we do things that we know are not right in the sight of God. We may be idolaters. We set something ahead of God, whether it's money or a job or a person. I don't know what it may be, but anything we put in the place of God becomes our what? God, right? So we can't set anything. Now, it could be uh, that... that there's a multitude of things. I don't need to spell all that out. But there's a multitude of things could take us away from God. Now there's sin that we can commit and that comes to our mind very readily. But there are also other areas that we may be disobedient in as well. Now I think maybe I mentioned this morning one of the biggest problems that Christians have. Maybe, let me back that up. One of the largest problems in the church is a is a Failure to forgive other people. You know, I, I, I'll never understand this. And uh, Mib, Mib told me this several times. Surely he, he, said, he said, Preacher, I don't understand why two people in the church. He said, two men in the church, they can get in a disagreement. And he said, they'll sit there on opposite pews and won't speak for two years. He said, two men out here in the bar. He said, they can get, they can get in an argument, get in a fist fight, and the next day they're best friends. He said that makes absolutely no sense. He said a Christian ought to be able to disagree and let it go. And listen, sometimes we let things get in the way of our fellowship. Sometimes we get a little burr under our saddle and we're unwilling to let somebody else go. Listen, Lord, or to forgive somebody else. Now, have you ever needed forgiveness in your life? I don't really, I, you know, all the things that I've done and said and failed to do and failed to say when I should have had, I don't have any right to not to forgive you if you've messed up. I don't know how I can expect God to forgive me if I'm unwilling to forgive you. And we all need forgiveness sometimes. Listen, this is a week before Bible school. It'd be good to preach a whole message on forgiveness and letting things go. 
because it's going to be hot next week and you know, and this person's going to think we ought to do everything like this and that person's going to think we ought to do everything like this and this person's going to think they got slighted on help and this person, they, they're going to think their, their group didn't get enough food or somebody said something to them in the craft, they was busy in crafts and somebody said something to them wasn't right. I'll tell you what, don't act like a daggone bunch of youngins, you know. I, that, it, it, just get over it, you know. If somebody says something, hey, just forgive them and go on. We're, we're most, uh, well, every one of you that's working Bible school, we're all adults, you know. It, there, you probably had situations in your life where everything didn't go your way. Or you didn't get everything that you wanted. You know what? Just get over it and go on. What we're trying to do is lead people to Jesus. What we're trying to do is teach people about Christ. How are we going to teach a bunch of kids the gospel if we act like a bunch of morons? If we can't even get along? You know, we're not... If you say, well, we got to share the love of Christ, and you oh, I can't believe that. What kind, of, what kind of testimony is that? You think those kids don't see that? It's easy to get agitated with somebody. They're, I never knew but one person that was perfect, and that was Jesus, and they, they crucified him. You know, sometimes you get, uh, what, what Nikki, y'all, y'all said that I was last year, what'd you say? I was grumpy, that's right. I was grumpy, that's the truth. And I, I, I didn't deny it, I don't like decorating, and they got me roped into hanging up some kind of banner. Did y'all see that last year? Went all the way across this, right there on that piece of wood. You know what that banner was made out of? Paper. You know how heavy that thing was. You put a thumbtack in that, brother, and then you wouldn't move five feet and it done fell out. It done pulled out of that thing. And I sit up there, that's one of them things, it, it, it almost make a preacher cuss. You've heard, you've heard people say, that's bad, ain't it? Uh, you know, you get grumpy about stuff like that. But uh, they didn't know no better when they ordinary, better not ordinary another paper when this year. Uh, shh. We won't worry about that right now. Disobedience. Refusal to obey the Lord. Sometimes we refuse to do what God wants us to do, don't we? Sometimes we know we're supposed to do something. Sometimes we know we're supposed to help somebody. Sometimes we know we're supposed to give, and we refuse to do it. And if you want to see your Christian testimony, if you want to see your life, your ministry ruined, you just begin to be disobedient. It might be small today. God lays on your heart maybe to help a missionary, maybe to put something in the plate for those missionaries tonight, and you miss that out. You say, God, it's going to be a tough week. I just don't know if I've got that extra $30 or whatever he laid on your heart. Listen, if you won't be obedient in the, in the small things, God's never going to trust you for the big things. We've got to be obedient to God, right? So, disobedience. Now, not only that, doubt and disobedience on the road to ruin, but also a disregard. Also a disregard. I want you to listen up and turn with me to verse 44, right there, if you can find that. The Bible says, They presumed to go up under the hill top. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. So there was a disregard. Once they slept on it, once they realized that they made a mistake, once they slept on it, then they presumed to go up. And they, pre- they presented themselves and said, now we'll go up. They presumed on the Lord and said, now we may have missed the opportunity, but now we're going to make it right. Now we're going to go. But Moses told them what? Don't go. He said, don't go. You done missed it. He said, you're messing up. And, and you see, Moses tried to tell them right, but they didn't listen. They disregarded Moses. They disregarded their leaders. I want to tell you something, folk. You need to listen to your leaders. God's placed them in a position for a reason. You need to listen to your leaders. Whether that be here in the church or or in the home or on the job, you need to listen to your leaders. God's placed them in an authority position for a reason. So the urging of Moses. Now, he, he told them the first time, be of good courage, go up. You can take the land, but now he said, don't go up. Don't go up. So they, he tells them to go up, and they don't go. And they, he tells them not to go up, and they do go. 
And Moses, the Bible says he was a godly man. They, they knew Moses. They, they knew that Moses had been used of God to lead them, yet they had no regard whatsoever for his opinion. And at that point, Moses, he, he just stepped by. Go ahead. You go, you'll go at your peril. You know, and, and to Moses' credit, he didn't go along with it, right? He didn't go along with their sin. He didn't, he didn't contribute to their disregard for what God wanted. He stayed behind. The Ark of the Covenant didn't go, and Moses didn't go either. So, not only, not only Moses, I'm talking about leaders, I'm talking about their pastor, their under-shepherd Moses, but also Joshua and Caleb, mighty men of valor. They're, they were faithful men. They were men that had been tried. They had been tested. They had been proven. And what did Joshua and Caleb say? We'd be well able to take the land. That's what they said. They said, let's go up and possess it. But the people wouldn't listen to them either. And there you go again. You had three godly men that tried to tell this company. And then you had, you had ten men that weren't so godly that didn't follow the Lord. That gives you another example of mob rule that didn't go the right way. So the people listened to the ten, and they didn't listen to their good and godly leaders, Moses and Joshua and Caleb. Listen to your leaders. So, you, you see, they disregarded their leaders, but more importantly than that, they, they disregarded the counsel of the Lord. Chapter number 13 says in verse number 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man. Everyone a ruler among them. God, God commanded them to go in and search the land. And God commanded them to go in and take the land. But they disregarded the Lord. They, they chose to go about their own way. To do their own thing. The Bible says that everything should be done decently and in order in the house of God. You, you can't have everybody just doing what they think is right. There's a reason that we do things a certain way. And these, these, this crowd did not listen. They didn't listen to the Lord. We can't just do what we want to do and then step back and ask God, say, God bless that. I, I did that for you, Lord. Bless that. We can't just bypass the people that God had placed in prominent positions and say, God, would you bless that? Listen, God ain't going to bless your your failure to submit to those in authority over you. I've told you this before. I share it again. It bears repeating. Adrian Rogers said, You can never be over what you're over until you're under what you're under. Everybody is in submission to somebody. It doesn't matter who you are. There's nobody that's the big cheese. You, may, you might really think you are, but we, we, we all serve God. It's like this. You know, we're serving Christ. Christ is the head of this church. Now, He uses leaders. He uses a pastor. He uses deacons, Sunday school teachers. He uses the Awana leaders. He, they're, they're all kind of leaders, but, but, but God Himself is the head. Christ Himself is the head of this church. So we determine His will, and then we move forward. But these men decided to do everything their own way. What if everything were done in the church like that today? What if, what if everybody just did what they felt was all right? And Well, if you did that, then you know, on Sunday morning, you'd have some come in at 10 o'clock for Sunday school. You'd have some drag in at 10 after 10. Um, maybe some drag in at a quarter after 10. And then they would come in and interrupt. Wait a minute, we already got that. Uh, well, if we could all get here at the same time. Um, you, you know, if we if we kind of if we had a if if we had a, maybe some kind of a uh, some some kind of rules or something. If we if we say okay, we're going to start at this time, and then we're here, and I'm not telling you not to come if you're late. I know sometimes people's late, so don't hear me say that. But you shouldn't be late every week. I mean, if you was late on your job like that, you wouldn't have your job very long. So I'm assuming that you probably can do that all right. So we can probably get to church on time as well. Um, but every, every man can't do what's right in his own sight. 
I mean, you, there, there's a way that things have to be done. And there's a way that a Christian has to do things. He has to do what God would have him to do. Listen, it, it's not, I can't always do what I want to do because sometimes I don't want to do the right thing. I want with everything in me sometimes to do the wrong thing. Just to give some. <laughs> but I know it's not right. I've got to submit to God. We've got, to, we've got to surrender ourselves completely. Why? Who knows what's best for me? God does, don't He? God knows. He knows what I need. He knows what I want. Sometimes what I want don't line up with what I need. So that's why i got to pray about what I need. God, help me to see. He knows the very best. So I have to trust when He don't give me what I want. I have to trust that He knows what's best for my life. But many times we disregard the Lord. They went about to do their own way. First, they didn't go up. And second, they decided they'd go on up there anyway. But God had already departed from them because of their rebellion. When you depart from God, if, if God listen, if God's not with you, you won't do anything a prophet. You won't do anything of value. You can study Brother Tyler all week long. If you've been rebellious and you're living in, in sin, if, you, if, you, if there's unconfessed sin in your life, you can study all week long and come up here and try to preach a sermon and you might as well preach that wall. Same thing with a Sunday school teacher. Same thing with your honor leaders. Same thing witnessing to somebody. You've got sin in your life. Your testimony ain't going to be worth anything. We need to be obedient unto God. So they disregarded their leaders, disregarded the Lord. The road to ruin, doubt, disobedience, disregard. And finally, verse number 45, very quickly, defeat. It ends in defeat. Then the Amalekites came down, the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them. And discomfited them even unto Hormah. So we mentioned before, there's nothing that we can do of value without the Lord. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Let's say it together. For without me ye can do nothing. Nothing. Without Jesus, I can't do anything. If God departs, when I, if God departs, I can't do. And listen, if, if, if I don't feel the presence of God, I might as well sit down. I can preach that I'm blue in the face, and sometimes I may do that. But if God's not in it, He's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. Right? Anything that we do, if we're disconnected from God, and they didn't even understand that. Even after Moses told them, they still went up. And decided they were going to do what they wanted to do. They, they wanted it their way. Goes back to that. I preached a message one time. Some of you may remember Burger King religion, right? I, just, just have it your way. Just do whatever you want to do. That's the way a lot of us are. We just do what we want to do. Listen, we can't do anything without the Lord. And we should go nowhere without the Lord. We should never go anywhere Moses said in Exodus 33, 15. Moses said, he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. If thy presence go not, carry us not up thence. We don't want to go, Lord, if you're not with us. We need to concentrate this week. Bible school's coming next week. I want you to promise me you'll pray this week. I want you to promise me that you'll pray, that you'll confess your sin, that you'll try to live right and do right with God's help. We need to make sure we got the power of God. Listen, this church will be nearly filled with children. If the Lord blesses like He has in years past, there'll be a crowd of youngins in here. And they'll be hungry. Many of them will come for a good time. Many of them will come for a good meal. But listen, we're going to give them a good message. We're going to give them a good God. Bro, Brother Tyler and I, we, we're going to, you, you're going to have fun with them. We're going to try to have a little fun with them too, but we're going to preach to them. Amen. We're going to teach them about Christ. And I want to see some of those kids saved. Amen. And as long as we're allowing 
sin in our lives, our, our, our work is going to be hindered. We need to make sure that there's nothing that will be a hindrance. Cast out any doubt. Get rid of any disobedience that you may have. If there's disregard for the Lord or for your leaders, you need to confess that now. Put it behind you. And try to move forward in unity to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus. Would you do that this week? Would you pray that God would help you? Maybe you might want to come in just a minute. We're going to have an invitation. You might want to come and just ask the Lord to help you do that starting right now. That God would would begin to help you to do that. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a hindrance. Father, we, we again thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for your grace and mercy. God, I pray you'd work in the hearts of this, your people tonight. And I pray that you'd draw us closer to you than we've ever been. Father, I pray if there's one here tonight, maybe there's open, unconfessed sin. If there's any like that, God, if there's a heart of unforgiveness, if there's a root of bitterness springing up anywhere, that we confess it before you that we might be forgiven. And God, if there's somebody here that we've offended, that we might go to that person and apologize and beg forgiveness from them as well. God, that we'd be able to go together with your presence. Lord, that we might meet the giants and and not have to worry or wonder, but know that you'll be with us. Know that you'll deliver your people. And what you promised you'll come through with. Help us this week, Lord. Help us now in Jesus' name. If you'll stand to your feet, Miss Shirley's going to play. Do you need to come? Do you need to be on the altar tonight? Maybe you just need to say, Lord, I want to make sure I'm not a hindrance. I want you to help me, God. I'm confessing before you right now. Lord, you know I fail you sometimes. But I want to be right. I want want to make sure that I've got your presence with me. And I want to make sure when folks pull on the property at this church, that they feel something. That they feel a difference. They feel a spirit of God. You're here tonight. There's something you're dealing with. You come laid out at the altar. You, You tell it to Jesus. You need to come. How long have you sat there holding on? Are you burdened down with something? Are you heavy hearted? Have you done everything you can do to resolve? If you have, you tried everything, you just depend on the Lord. You come tonight and cry out to God. Do you need to come? Do you know Christ is your Savior? others tonight. Some are praying. You can pray right where you are. I know some of you are not able to get up to the altar. You pray where you are, but if you if you can come to the altar, come. If you're praying tonight, if you can come to the altar, you come. Any others? Some continue to pray. Do you need to pray as well? Any others tonight? Any others?
Well, we do appreciate you coming tonight. Don't forget, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., uh, we'll have a prayer meeting here Wednesday night. Brother Tyler have the youth over toward the Life Center somewhere, I'm supposing, Wednesday night. And the young folks will go with Michelle and Charlie. So you come on to church Wednesday night. Be praying this week. Be praying especially building up the Bible school. Need your prayers, prayers, prayers. Be prayer warriors. Get at it. Get on. Put the hounds of heaven on these young children. We, we want to see a bunch of them saved. And certainly remember to pray for our nation as you go. We do appreciate your presence here uh, this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Chris Green if you close us in prayer.